Club History, the show where we share our favorite stories from Boston history. This is episode 57, The Halifax Explosion. Hi, I'm Nikki. And I'm Jake. This week, we're going to discuss the 1917 explosion in Halifax Harbor, which was the largest man-made explosion prior to the atomic bomb. The blast leveled a large tract of the city, leaving 25,000, more than half of the city's population, homeless. With almost 11,000 killed or injured, Boston responded with manpower, supplies, and funds that led to an ongoing bond between the two cities. But before we talk about the collision and its aftermath, it's time to take a look at this week's featured historic site and upcoming event. We're guessing that many of you Bostonians, and nearly Bostonians, have visitors who are coming into town for the holidays and would like a day out in the city. To cut back on your holiday stress, we wanted to make it easy for you. This week, instead of suggesting just one location to visit, we have a friends and family tour to propose. After listening to this week's episode, we know that you will want to stop by Boston Common and see the Christmas tree. You'll find it near the Visitor Center on the Tremont Street side of the Common, with Park Street Station as the closest T-stop. For those of you looking for some seasonally festive activities, you can then head over to the Frog Pond and rent some ice skates. The rink opens at 10 a.m. every day. But because they only have balance aids for children and not for adults, I personally will not be skating this winter or next. Instead, I would head up Tremont Street to King's Chapel for the Bells and Bones tour. King's Chapel has a unique past and played a foundational role in early Boston. Founded as an Anglican congregation in 1686, the church has humble origins as a small wooden meeting house at the corner of Tremont and School Streets. Due to a growing membership and a deteriorating structure, a new building made of Quincy granite was constructed and opened in 1754. A bell forged in England was hung in 1772, but it cracked in 1814 and was recast by Paul Revere and rehung in 1816. Today, the church is an independent congregation affiliated with the Unitarian Universalist Association that follows an Anglican liturgy. The Bells and Bones tour will take you up into the bell tower to see the Paul Revere bell and then down into the crypts for some subterranean history. I suggest that you bring your dusty old digital camera, because you can hold it inside one of the crypts and take a photo. We'll post a picture in the show notes so you can see what I'm talking about, but definitely don't bring something that would ruin your day if you drop it, because you will never ever get it back. We'll also post a link to the tour times, which run Friday through Monday. By now you'll be hungry, so head up Tremont and cut across City Hall Plaza to Union Street and the Union Oyster House. You'll pass by the tourist staples, Faneuil Hall and Quincy Market. Founded in 1826, the Union Oyster House is the oldest restaurant in Boston and the oldest continually operating restaurant in the United States. We don't know the date of construction for the building, but we do know that it's over 250 years old. In 1771, Patriot printer Isaiah Thomas published his newspaper, The Massachusetts Spy, from an upper floor. If seafood isn't your thing, and it's certainly not my thing, head to the end of the block to Boston Public Market. You'll pass by Marshall Street, known as the Blackstone Block, which is a step back into 18th century Boston, and absolutely gorgeous in the snow. The block contains the Ebenezer Hancock House. In the show notes, we'll link to a Boston Landmarks Commission study report which states, The Ebenezer Hancock House possesses considerable historical significance as the last extant Boston structure associated with John Hancock, and as an important Revolutionary War era site once occupied by Ebenezer Hancock, younger brother of John and Deputy Paymaster General of the Continental Army. The building's first floor shop has additional significance as the former site of the longest continually operating shoe store in the country, having served that function from 1798 to 1963. As the headquarters of the Deputy Paymaster General and the location from which money was dispersed to the troops, the house was an important military rendezvous during the Revolution. In this connection, a loan of two million silver crowns from Louis XVI of France for the financing of the army, negotiated in Paris by Benjamin Franklin, is reported to have been stored in the house in 1778. Continue on to the public market for lunch or for some last-minute holiday shopping. 
If you come on Friday or Saturday, you'll pass by the fringes of Haymarket, an outdoor produce market, to the building that houses Haymarket Station, where the public market's located. You'll find local produce, meat, cheese, seafood, bread, and all kinds of gifts for the foodies in your life, as well as a variety of options for lunch, including my favorite, Ina's Kitchen, where you can get shakshuka and latkes. You might also pick up chocolate challah from the Somerville Bread Company for French toast the next morning. Finally, head over to Cambridge Street and turn right for historic New England's Harrison Gray Otis House. As their website describes, the Otis House is the last surviving mansion in Bowdoin Square in Boston's West End neighborhood. Charles Bullfinch designed the house for Harrison Gray Otis, a lawyer who was instrumental in developing nearby Beacon Hill, served in Congress, and was a mayor of Boston. It is the first of three houses Bullfinch designed for Otis and his wife, Sally Foster Otis. The house reflects the classical proportions and delicate detail of the federal style. We recently visited the house and were impressed with how populated the house is with period artifacts and absolutely stunning carpeting and wallpaper. We'll share a few photos to whet your appetite. With that, you can consider it a day well spent. If you have a few more steps in you, head over to the North End for dinner or stroll through Beacon Hill and down Charles Street for some antiquing and end up back in the common. And for our upcoming event this week, we're recommending a classic Boston experience, the 244th Anniversary Boston Tea Party Reenactment. The event will be held on Saturday, December 16th at 6.30 p.m. in partnership between Old South Meeting House and the Boston Tea Party Ships and Museum. This is a living history event with the following description on Old South Meeting House's website. Gather at Old South Meeting House, the actual historic landmark where colonists met in 1773 with Boston's infamous rabble-rousers like Samuel Adams, Paul Revere, and even some crown-loving loyalists to debate the tea tax and demand liberty from the British crown. Then, join the procession to Griffin's Wharf, accompanied by fife and drum and scores of colonists and line the shores of Boston Harbor to witness the destruction of the tea firsthand, as the Sons of Liberty storm the Brig Beaver, tossing the troublesome tea into the sea. We'll include a link to purchase tickets, as the event does sell out each year. Now, let's turn to our main topic, the 1917 Halifax Explosion, which has its 100th anniversary this week. Harold J. Connolly nine years old at the time of the explosion, describes his memories of that day. It happened on a mild sunshine morning. The date was December 6th, 1917. I was late for class that day, and, as was the custom, I knelt by my desk to say the class morning prayers. As I got off my knees, I remember we were doing a Latin lesson, I said to Parker Hickey, my seatmate, What page are we at? As I did so, I glanced out the window and saw a huge ball of fire in the sky. I yelled, Look at the fire. As the heads turned, there came a terrific blast that rocked and damaged the building. The glass was smashed in every window. Our teacher had the unique habit of having his desk face the window. Flying glass cost him the eye that was not turned away from the window. Statues were knocked from their pedestals. Plaster filled the air like thick fog. Brother McCartney ordered us to link hands and to head for the corridor. Another survivor remembers, We could see the fire, but could not tell what was burning. Mrs. Foran said that Agnes had better not start for school until they saw the fire apparatus going back. She was afraid that the school might be burning, and she did not want Agnes to go while there was any danger. They were looking through the window when, according to Agnes, the sky opened. Mrs. Foran screamed and said, The end of the world's here. They were knocked down on the floor. The windows were blown in, and things smashed up a good deal. But the house did not collapse. She called up to her mother that the baby was all right, and Mrs. Foran told her to come up and help her downstairs, as she could not see. Agnes went up and led her mother down. Then she got cloths and water for her mother and helped her bathe her eyes in cuts. When Mrs. Foran realized that she was really blind... She got Agnes to take her outdoors, and she stood there and called for help, while Agnes went into the house and got the baby. Agnes left the baby with her mother, and went about the neighborhood looking for someone to come to her mother's aid. 
About 10 o'clock, Violet Foran, aged 17, came home from her working place. There was nothing that she could do, so they all stayed there together until Mr. Foran came, about 10.30. He got a man with an automobile to take Agnes and Mrs. Foran, with the baby, to Victoria General Hospital. About the time that her father arrived, Agnes began to get sleepy. They got a chair for her to sit on. Her father examined her and found that her stomach was all cut and her clothing all saturated with blood. It was, however, not until late in the afternoon that they discovered how badly she was hurt. One piece of glass was taken out about half the size of a woman's hand. When Dr. McDougall discovered it, there was a tiny pinhead sticking out. He tried to pull it out, but it had to be cut. These are the recollections of two adults who remember experiencing and surviving the Halifax explosion on December 6, 1917. The blast, which was the largest man-made explosion prior to the development of nuclear weapons, was caused by a collision between a French cargo ship carrying explosives and a Norwegian vessel, the SS Emo. With 1,950 confirmed deaths and approximately 9,000 injured, the disaster leveled structures within a half-mile radius. The destruction was unprecedented. So how did this happen? Wikipedia actually has a very clear outline of the circumstances leading up to the collision, so thank you to the anonymous editor of that page. The Norwegian ship SS Emo had sailed from the Netherlands en route to New York to take on wartime relief supplies for Belgium, under the command of Haken Frohm. She arrived in Halifax on December 3rd for neutral inspection, and spent two days in Bedford Basin on the northwest end of the harbor, awaiting refueling and supplies. Emo's departure, cleared on December 5th, was delayed when her coal load did not arrive until late that afternoon. The loading of fuel was not completed until after the anti-submarine nets had been raised for the night. Therefore, the vessel could not weigh anchor until the next morning. The French cargo ship SS Mont Blanc arrived from New York late on December 5th. The vessel was fully loaded with explosives TNT and picric acid, the highly flammable fuel benzol, and gun cotton. She intended to join a slow convoy readying to depart for Europe, but was too late to enter the harbor before the nets were raised, and prepared to spend the night in Bedford Basin. Ships carrying dangerous cargo were not allowed into the harbor before the war, but the risks posed by German submarines had resulted in a relaxation of regulations. Navigating into or out of Bedford Basin required passage through a strait called the Narrows. Ships were expected to keep to the starboard side of the channel as they passed oncoming traffic. As such, vessels were required to pass port to port. Ships were restricted to a speed of 5.8 miles per hour. Emo was granted clearance to leave Bedford Basin by signals from the guard ship HMCS Acadia at approximately 7.30 in the morning on December 6th, with pilot William Hayes on board. The ship entered the Narrows well above the harbor's speed limit in an attempt to make up for the delay experienced in loading her cargo. Emo met American tramp steamer SS Clara being piloted up the wrong side of the harbor, the western side. The pilots agreed to pass starboard to starboard. Soon afterwards, though, Emo was forced to head even farther towards the wrong side of the channel after passing the tugboat Stella Maris, which was traveling up the harbor to Bedford Basin near mid-channel. Horatio Brannan, the captain of the Stella Maris, saw Emo approaching at excessive speed and ordered his tugboat closer to the western shore to avoid an accident. Francis Mackey, an experienced harbor pilot, had boarded Mont Blanc the previous evening. He asked about special protections, such as a guard ship, given the Mont Blanc's cargo, but no protections were put in place. Mont Blanc started moving at 7.30 a.m., and was the second ship to enter the harbor as the anti-submarine net between George's Island and Pier 21 opened for the morning. Mont Blanc headed towards Bedford Basin in the opposite direction of the Emo. Mackey kept his eye on the ferry traffic between Halifax and Dartmouth and other small boats in the area. He first spotted Emo when she was about three-quarters of a mile away and became concerned as her path appeared to be heading towards his ship's starboard side, as if to cut him off his own course. Mackey gave a short blast of his ship's signal whistle to indicate that he had the right-of-way, but was met with two short blasts from Emo, indicating that the approaching vessel would not yield its position. 
The captain ordered Montblanc to halt her engines and angle slightly to starboard, closer to the Dartmouth side of the Narrows. He let out another single blast of his whistle, hoping the other vessel would likewise move to starboard, but was again met with a double blast in negation. Sailors and nearby ships heard the series of signals and, realizing that a collision was imminent, gathered to watch as Emo bore down on Mont Blanc. Though both ships had cut their engines by this point, their momentum carried them right on top of each other at slow speed. Unable to ground his ship for fear that a shock would set off his explosive cargo, Mackey ordered Mont Blanc to steer hard to port and cross the Norwegian ship's bow in a last-ditch effort to avoid a collision. The two ships were almost parallel to each other when Ebo suddenly sent out three signal blasts, indicating the ship was reversing its engines. The combination of the empty ship's height in the water and the traverse thrust of her right-hand propeller caused the ship's head to swing into Mont Blanc. Emo's prow pushed through the French vessel's number one hold on her starboard side. The collision occurred at 8.45 a.m. While the damage to Mont Blanc was not severe, it toppled benzol barrels that broke open and flooded the deck. The fuel quickly flowed into the hold. As Emo's engines kicked in, she quickly disengaged, which created sparks inside Mont Blanc's hull. These ignited the vapors from the benzol. A fire started at the waterline and traveled quickly up the side of the ship as the benzol spewed out from crushed drums on Mont Blanc's decks. The fire quickly became uncontrollable. Surrounded by thick black smoke and fearing she would explode almost immediately, the captain ordered the crew to abandon ship. At this point, the signal blasts, coupled with billowing smoke, alerted residents that something was amiss. Citizens gathered on the street or stood at the windows of their homes or businesses to watch the spectacular fire. The frantic crew of Mont Blanc shouted from their two lifeboats to some of the other vessels that their ship was about to explode, but they could not be heard above the noise and confusion. As the lifeboats made their way across the harbor to the Dartmouth shore, the abandoned ship continued to drift and beached herself at Pier 6 near the foot of Richmond Street. Towing two scows at the time of the collision, the tugboat Stella Maris responded immediately to the fire, anchoring the barges and steaming back towards Pier 6 to spray the burning ship with their fire hose. The tug's captain, Horatio Brannan, and his crew realized that the fire was too intense for their single hose and they backed off from the burning Mont Blanc. They were approached by a whaler from HMS High Flyer and later a steam pinnace belonging to HMCS Niobe. Captain Brannan and Albert Matheson of Niobe agreed to secure a line to the French ship's stern so as to pull it away from the pier to avoid setting it on fire. The 5-inch hawser initially produced was deemed too small and orders for a 10-inch hawser came down. It was at this point that the blast occurred. Jean Holder experienced it thus. A blinding light. Crash. Bang. Rumble, rumble. Oh, a thunderstorm? It's worse than that. That big cloud up there frothing at the edges must mean it's the end of the world. Such were the thoughts of a six-year-old when the Mont Blanc exploded. It was the end of the world for hundreds and hundreds of Haligonians. At 9.04 a.m., the out-of-control fire on board Mont Blanc finally set off her highly explosive cargo. The ship was completely blown apart, and a powerful blast wave radiated away from the explosion at more than 3,300 feet per second. Temperatures of 9,000 degrees Fahrenheit and pressures of thousands of atmospheres accompanied the moment of detonation at the center of the explosion. White-hot shards of iron fell down upon Halifax and Dartmouth. Mont Blanc's forward 90mm gun, its barrel melted away, landed approximately three and a half miles north of the explosion site, while the shank of her anchor, weighing half a ton, landed two miles south. A cloud of white smoke rose to over 11,800 feet. The shockwave was felt 130 miles away at Cape Breton Island. An area of over 400 acres, larger than Boston's Back Bay, was completely destroyed by the explosion, and the harbor floor itself was momentarily exposed by the volume of water that vaporized. 
Water rushing back in to fill the void formed a 60-foot tsunami that then slammed into Halifax. Over 1,600 people were killed almost instantly, and 9,000 were injured, more than 300 of whom later died. For a town of 47,000, that was 23% of the population killed or injured. An equivalent tragedy in Boston today would impact about 153,000 people. Every building within a 1.6-mile radius, over 12,000 in total, was destroyed or badly damaged. Hundreds of people who had been watching the fire from their homes were blinded when the blast wave shattered the windows in front of them. Stoves and lamps overturned by the force of the blast sparked fires throughout Halifax, particularly in the North End, where entire city blocks were caught up in the inferno, trapping residents inside their houses. Firefighter Billy Wells, who was thrown away from the explosion and had his clothes torn from his body, described the devastation survivors faced. The sight was awful, with people hanging out of the windows dead, some with their heads missing, some thrown onto the overhead telegraph wires. He was the only surviving member of the eight-man crew of the fire engine Patricia, which responded to the pier with the intent of fighting the fire on the Mont Blanc. It could have been even worse. After the crash and initial fire, a railway dispatcher named Vince Coleman, who had been operating at the railroad about 750 feet from Pier 6, began to flee with another worker. While running away, he remembered that an incoming passenger train from St. John, New Brunswick was due to arrive within minutes. He returned to his post alone and sent telegrams down the wire to the surrounding towns, telling them to hold the train. His last telegram said, Hold up the train. Ammunition ship a fire in harbor making for Pier 6 and will explode. Guess this will be my last message. Goodbye, boys. The incoming train heeded the warning and stopped at Rockingham, a safe distance from the blast, saving the lives of about 300 railway passengers. Coleman was killed at his post instantly. He was honored with a Heritage Minute in the 1990s and inducted into the Canadian Railway Hall of Fame in 2004. A letter from 17-year-old Walter Hoganson of Halifax to 16-year-old Harold Kennedy of Stoughton, Massachusetts reads, I was at work at the time in the newspaper office of the Daily Echo, a Halifax paper, and about 9.05 the lights went out very slowly. I was watching the lights going out when there was a short rumble and then a big crash, a terrific, terrifying roar. I got as low as I could and the glass and wood flew everywhere, but I didn't get a scratch. Harold, our big steady building rocked like a little cradle. I got out of the building and when I got on the street, everybody was running everywhere. People with scratches, cuts, and bruises were yelling, The Dirty Huns! They're here at last! And many other things, thinking it was an air raid. While getting clear of this, my first thoughts were of home. Getting home? I found everybody all right. That night, a wild storm howled. Snow, sleet, and wind. I was expecting our chimney to fall at any moment, but it lasted out all right. The next day, the work of relief started and thank God the noble state of Massachusetts stood the same as ever, ready to help us. I tell you, I don't know what we would have done without the Americans, because we were left powerless by the explosion. Survivors immediately sprang into action, pulling the victims from the rubble. Policemen, firefighters, and military personnel soon began to lead the efforts, and anyone with a working vehicle was called upon to volunteer. The city's hospitals were quickly overwhelmed and the new military hospital, Camp Hill, admitted approximately 1,400 victims that day. Royal Navy cruisers in port sent some of the first organized rescue parties ashore and took wounded aboard. American cruiser USS Tacoma and armed merchant cruiser USS Von Steuben were passing Halifax at the time of the explosion en route to the United States. Tacoma was rocked so severely by the blast wave that her crew went to their battle stations. Spotting the large and rising column of smoke, Tacoma altered course and arrived to assist with rescue at 2 p.m. Von Steuben arrived about a half an hour later. The American steamship Old Colony, docked in Halifax for repairs, suffered little damage and was quickly converted to serve as a hospital ship staffed by doctors and orderlies from the British and American Navy vessels in the harbor. Led by Lieutenant Governor McCallum Grant, leading citizens formed the Halifax Relief Commission at around noon. 
They organized medical relief for both Halifax and Dartmouth, supplying transportation, food, and shelter, and covering medical and funeral costs for victims. The commission continued until 1976, participating in reconstruction and relief efforts and later distributing pensions to survivors. Rescue trains were dispatched from across Atlantic Canada, as well as the northeastern United States. The first arrived by noon, carrying medical personnel and supplies. Fortunately, Coleman's telegrams and those sent immediately after the blast alerted other cities to the disaster. Within just minutes of the explosion, a Boston banker received the following telegram on a private telegraph line. Organize a relief train and send word to Wolfville and Windsor, towns that were near Halifax, to round up all doctors, nurses, and Red Cross supplies possible to obtain. No time to explain details, but list of casualties is enormous. John U. Bacon, author of The Great Halifax Explosion, describes the action taken in Boston in those first hours. Within two hours of getting in the news about the explosion, a hundred city leaders put together a committee, the Massachusetts Halifax Relief Committee, and they sent two trains, two ships, 100 doctors, 300 nurses, a million dollars worth of supplies, cars with gas and chauffeurs, enough to run several temporary hospitals. However, traversing the 400 miles from Boston to Halifax proved challenging. The report of the Halifax Relief Expedition to Massachusetts Governor Samuel McCall describes the efforts of one relief train to make its way through a severe blizzard. The first news of the disaster was received at the State House at about 11 a.m. on December 6th. Immediately, you sent a telegram to the mayor of Halifax, offering the unlimited assistance of the Commonwealth, and called a meeting of the Massachusetts Public Safety Committee, composed of 100 men representing all parts of the state, for 2.30 that afternoon to take action relative to handling the relief work. Although short notice was given, the meeting was largely attended. Upon your request as to how soon and in what manner medical aid could be arranged, Colonel William A. Brooks, acting Surgeon General of the Commonwealth, stated that if a special train could be had, he would be able to dispatch a large corps of surgeons, doctors, and nurses, and surgical and medical supplies in a few hours. And at your suggestion, this plan was adopted by the committee, and James H. Hustis, receiver for the Boston and Maine Railroad and a member of the committee, agreed to have a train ready by 10 o'clock that night. We left Boston at 10 o'clock on the evening of the disaster, and at Portland, Maine, and at each station from there on until we reached St. John, New Brunswick the next morning, we wired continuously to the mayor of Halifax without receiving an answer. At McAdam Junction, we tried to get news from Halifax, but the most we obtained were rumors, and the more we received, the worse they sounded. After consulting with Major Giddings, I called a meeting of the doctors and nurses and Red Cross workers and requested that they take an inventory of the supplies to learn if there was anything else they might need in such an emergency as I believed existed in Halifax, although we knew nothing definite. After leaving McAdam Junction, we were besieged at every stop with requests for accommodations on our train for workers going to Halifax in various capacities. I instructed those in charge of the train to fill every available space, giving doctors and nurses the preference. Upon our arrival at St. John, I instructed Captains Hyde and Lapham of the Quartermaster's Department to secure additional drugs and supplies. They commandeered the services of King Kelly Esquire, a prominent lawyer of the city of St. John, who was waiting at the depot to go to Halifax as a member of the St. John unit. With his assistance, we obtained large quantities of all kinds of medical supplies. At St. John, we encountered a heavy snowstorm, one of the severest of the winter, accompanied by a gale of terrible velocity. The snow was piling up and progress was difficult. We lost considerable time between St. John and Moncton. At this point, to ensure getting through to Halifax, a large freight engine was attached to the train. Beyond Truro and Moncton, the storm increased and was a veritable blizzard. We were also delayed several hours while our engine, which had broken down, was repaired. 
The climax was reached when we came up Folly Mountain, and the conductor in charge, C.H. Truman, accompanied by C.K. Howard, General Agent, Canadian Government Railways, stated that, as an enormous snowdrift lay across the track, it was impossible to proceed further. I then showed them the telegram from the official of the railroad, in which orders were given for the right-of-way to the special train. I picture these grizzled railroad men considering the storm, the drifts, and the Americans with this telegram. They were proud Canadians, and while they didn't know exactly what had happened in Halifax, they had enough fragmentary information from the telegraph lines to know it was bad. They threw all caution to the wind, ignored safety precautions and railroad regulations. Working all night, they used a train as a snowplow and good old-fashioned elbow grease to open the tracks. The train would get through. I pleaded with them to do everything in their power known to railroad men to clear the track. Under general conditions, no attempt would have been made to keep the train moving, but the need was tremendously urgent. The men realizing this, and knowing that every moment was precious, worked like Trojans. Within an hour, by hard shoveling, the use of steam and ramming, and amid great cheers from all on board, we went through the drift, which extended higher than the door of the baggage car. We succeeded in reaching Truro, and found another engine and crew waiting for the final haul to Halifax. The train finally arrived in Halifax that morning, met with city officials, and the crew got to work setting up a hospital. By six o'clock that night, we had installed an operating room and had fitted up wards with 100 beds and medical supplies taken from our relief train. On account of the urgency of the situation, we received about 60 patients at nine o'clock that night, and by noon the next day after our arrival, the fully equipped American Bellevue Hospital, flying the American flag, was caring for 100 patients and in full running order. This hospital received the worst cases from the different hospitals, which had become so overcrowded that proper attention could not be given to them. As the hospitals became overwhelmed, many injured victims waited at home. Some had chosen to yield their place to the more gravely injured. Others didn't realize how badly they were hurt due to the initial shock and then the hardship of surviving a snowstorm in a destroyed city. Within days, teams of Massachusetts doctors started a house-to-house canvas of the injured. Six-year-old Jean Holder, whose account we read earlier, which began with a crash bang, described her mother's treatment. A few days after the explosion, mother answered a knock at the door to find a lady and two gentlemen there. One of the gentlemen introduced themselves as a nurse and two doctors from Massachusetts. He said that all the hospitals and clinics were well-staffed and that they were now making a house-to-house canvas looking for people who were injured and didn't know it. He asked permission to come in and examine us. They pronounced us well and uninjured. Having examined us, the doctor turned to mother. What about yourself? Oh, I'm all right. Then why is your head wrapped up like that? Mother felt her head and remarked, Oh, gracious. I was dressing one of the children when the explosion occurred and blood trickled down my neck, so I grabbed a nightdress and tied it around my head. I didn't realize it was still there. Examination revealed that her ear had been almost completely torn off. Her face had been paralyzed and was twisted out of shape. The doctors knew to look at her that she had been injured. On the day of the explosion, Granddad had asked Dad, Where's Gertie? Who's that crazy-looking woman with the children? He hadn't recognized her. The doctor asked Mother if she would like him to sew the ear back in place, or would she prefer to go to her own doctor. She said for them to do it, but first she would like to get a neighbor to come in and keep an eye on us in case she fainted. The neighbor came. Mother didn't faint. No anesthetic was necessary as the paralysis prevented any feeling in that part of her head. She was advised to go to her own doctor or a clinic after a few days. In episode 39, we discussed the ways in which the Coconut Grove fire improved the way hospitals treat burn injuries. Similarly, the treatment of eye injuries was significantly advanced as a result of the Halifax explosion. Dr. George H. Cox, an eye, ear, nose, and throat specialist from New Glasgow, a town 62 miles away, joined the early relief effort. An article from the U.S. National Library of Medicine details his experience. Cox walked from the train to the Camp Hill Hospital, a private veterans hospital with 250 beds, and found over 1,500 men, women, and children lining the corridors. He first worked at a kitchen table setting bones and repairing wounds, but quickly realized that the large number of eye cases required his expertise. 
Among the local physicians who responded immediately were four other EENT specialists, E.A. Kirkpatrick, E.A. Mathers, A.E. Duell, and A.R. Cunningham. With the assistance of a sergeant, a nursing sister, and an anesthetist, Cox started operating and did not stop for several days. Pieces of glass were driven clear through the eyeball, he wrote, and one found it was necessary to feel about in the orbital tissue before dressing the case. Cox found pieces of glass as large as a square inch embedded into the orbit. Eyelids were cut into literal fringes, and in addition to removal of the eyeball, one often had to hunt to find any material to reconstruct a set of lids. In many cases, the eyes were completely destroyed. Cox went along the rows of patients examining eyes and marking those who required operations. He then placed linen tags on his patients listing their name, address, injury, treatment, and future needs. On the fifth day, the train from Montreal arrived with Captain T.F. Took, an EENT specialist with the Canadian Army Medical Corps. Took found Cox in the small back room at the Camp Hill Hospital operating by the light of a single bulb. Cox had performed so many operations that his instruments would no longer cut. While the injured were being treated, Halifax also had to make arrangements for the dead. A mortuary committee chaired by Alderman R.B. Caldwell was quickly formed at Halifax City Hall on the morning of the disaster. A company of the Royal Canadian Engineers repaired and converted the basement of a school to serve as a morgue and classrooms to serve as offices for the Halifax coroner. Coroner Arthur S. Barnstead took over from Coldwell as the morgue went into operation and implemented a system to carefully number and describe bodies. In a surprising mashup of historic disasters, his methods were based on the system developed by his father, John Henry Barnstead, to identify Titanic victims in 1912. It's hard to know where this narrative should end. The initial Massachusetts contingency returned after two weeks, but efforts continued for decades. The Massachusetts Halifax Relief Committee oversaw the distribution of the relief fund for Massachusetts, which contributed, in goods and money, a sum total of $750,000, $12.5 million today. Nova Scotia donated a large Christmas tree to the city of Boston the following year in thanks and remembrance for the state's aid. Another tree was sent in 1971, and the tradition then continued annually. The annual gift was started by the Lunenburg County Christmas Tree Producers Association to promote Christmas tree exports as well as acknowledge the Boston support after the explosion. The gift was taken over by the Nova Scotia government in 1976 to continue the goodwill gesture and to promote trade and tourism. This year, In honor of the 100th anniversary of the explosion, Boston Mayor Martin J. Walsh, Halifax Mayor Michael Savage, and Nova Scotia Premier Stephen McNeil unveiled a plaque on Boston Common near the site of the tree. The Nova Scotia Department of Natural Resources has specific guidelines for selecting the tree. It must be an attractive balsam fir, white spruce, or red spruce, 40 to 50 feet tall, healthy with good color, medium to heavy density, uniform and symmetrical, and easy to access. In addition to this large tree, smaller trees are gifted to Rosie's Place and the Pine Street Inn. Before the tree is cut, each branch is individually tied to the trunk. It takes two workers about a day and a half to prepare the tree to be cut. A crane holds the tree at the top while it is cut at the base by a chainsaw. The tree cutting ceremony features representatives from the province, the U.S. Consulate in Halifax, the Christmas Tree Council of Nova Scotia, hundreds of local school children, a town crier, Royal Canadian Mounted Police, Nova Scotia conservation officials, a bagpiper, the Nova Scotia Mass Choir, and Santa Claus. The tree travels over 750 miles to Boston, with a stop at the Grand Parade in Halifax for a public send-off ceremony. Attendees are invited to sign a thank you book for Boston. The tree then travels by truck across Nova Scotia, then cruises on a ferry across the Bay of Fundy, continuing by truck through Maine and New Hampshire to Boston. 
In 2013, the tree was led out of Halifax by a group of runners in honor of the victims of the Boston Marathon bombings. The tree arrives in Boston under police escort. In the same way that school children see the tree off in Nova Scotia, school children from Boston are on hand to welcome it to the common. In 2016, the gifting of the tree cost Nova Scotia about $242,000, which includes scouting and cutting the tree, shipment, and the ceremonies and advertising in both cities. The Halifax explosion bonded Bostonians and Haligonians with a lasting and meaningful connection. After the marathon bombing in 2013, Nova Scotia sent a donation of $50,000 to Massachusetts General Hospital's Pediatric Palliative Care Program. Premier Daryl Dexter wrote in a note to the hospital, While there is a border and a number of miles between us, we share a common heritage and ancestors. Massachusetts was there for Nova Scotia 96 years ago during the tragedy of the Halifax explosion and many times since then. Our hearts and minds are with the people of Boston now and in the future. To learn more about the Halifax explosion and Boston's response, check out this week's show notes at hubhistory.com slash 057. We'll link to a gallery of photos taken by the Massachusetts Halifax Relief Committee, the U.S. National Library of Medicine article with a detailed account of the eye care delivered by first responders, and the full report of the Halifax Relief Expedition. We'll also link to an eight-minute video from WBUR featuring an interview with The Great Halifax Explosion author John U. Bacon. And, of course, we'll have links to information about this week's featured historic site and upcoming event. If you want to get in touch with us, you can email us at podcast at hubhistory.com. We are Hub History on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Or you can go to hubhistory.com and click on the Contact Us link. While you're on the site, hit the subscribe link and be sure that you never miss an episode. If you subscribe on Apple Podcasts, please think about writing us a brief review. It's still the best way to help others discover the show. That's all for now. We'll be back next time to talk about the human computers of Harvard.